start with Henry because Henry's not a panelist, but he's going to help to moderate when, when we get when the panelists get done, and we're going to ask you all to chime in. Not you can ask questions if you want, but mainly the idea is to say what about this resonates for you with your experience with quest with with issues that you have in the justice work that you've done. Um, so Henry's going to help to moderate that discussion. So that, uh, so thank you to this wonderful group of panelists, and let me introduce you to them. On the far end is Brooke Reynolds. She's originally from Buffalo. She studied in Ithaca and in Jordan, and she's a supporter of Jalil Muntakim, who's a political prisoner um, in prison now in Attica, right here near Buffalo. She met Jalil two years ago when he was a prisoner at Auburn, which is where David is now. Um, and she's been working closely with him ever since. She's running the Behind the Wall series. What is the Behind the Wall series? Is that here? Yeah, it's the okay. second Wednesday of every month. This coming Wednesday is the next one in two days. About Jaleel and about the Black Liberation Army. And um, working on gaining Jaleel's release at his next parole hearing, which is in June. Um, the next to Brooke is Kareem. <coughs> Karima Ami, who was a native Buffalonian, retired public school teacher, a published author and storyteller, drummer, justice advocate, director of the organization, the Buffalo organization, Prisoners Are People Too, and co-chair of the Erie County Prisoners' Rights Coalition. She was named Humanitarian of the Year in 2007 by the University of Buffalo College of Arts and Sciences for her work with formerly incarcerated people. She's a long time central pillar of struggle for rights for prisoners in Buffalo and, and beyond. <laughs> yeah. Leslie. Leslie James Pickering, former spokesperson for the Earth Liberation Front Press Office and co-owner of Burning Books with Teresa Baker and, and Nate Buckley, who are here as well. Thank you to all of you for having us. Sheila Hayes is um, also an activist and advocate for prisoner justice, and she is the wife of political prisoner Seth Hayes, also long-term, long-term political prisoner who is in prison and now in um, Sullivan, and um, travels to support him, and um, is uh, the foundation of Seth's support network. So, actually we did not talk about what order we were going to do all this in. Uh, <laughs> we, should, we should have done that, but I think it doesn't matter. Look, are you okay to start? You just go, sure. go across in the order that you're sitting in? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Should I start? Um, yeah, how about a little welcome for this fabulous panel? <laughs> So I really identify um, with the young woman that Naomi said felt like this book was written as a letter. Um, I totally agree. It's really, really personable and very humble, and I respond a lot. Um, one of the main things that I identified with was sort of coming to resistance as a white person. I was similar to David, you know, all about peace and justice for all, and America being a wonderful democracy, and I thought that if people just wanted peace and love, everything would be wonderful. And there's a part in which he talks about um, sort of his, his coming to be, coming to realize that perhaps the oppression that was happening at the hands of his government was more than he had realized, and um, starting to question what his own responsibility was. Um, so he says, He's talking about um, kind of coming to understand what's going on in the third world. So he says, he came to realize that the greatest violent of all was the social violence of hunger and disease and wasted potential that characterized the conditions of more than two billion people in the third world. At the same time, history showed that the ruthless use of military, economic, and political power made peaceful change impossible. Caring about people, one needs to stop the massive, excruciating social violence mandated a willingness to fight. I now understood where the guerrillas in Guatemala came from, and I supported them. But then another troubling thought entered my mind. Now that I know it's necessary and right for Guatemalans to fight and die because of what my government is doing, 
What then is my responsibility? Can I continue to be a pacifist while they are paying such a high price for what the U.S. does? And then he goes on to question what that means for him. And he talks about, as a white person studying at Columbia, that he had been able to garner a sense of moral purity, right? He's a good person. So he says, but there, was, you know, for a while there had almost been a guarantee of a certain level of moral purity. But then he was put in touch with the need to also look at results in the real world. Stopping intolerable social violence was more important than my own personal purity. True morality is based in caring about other people and requires both good intentions and intelligent strategies to achieve qualitative change. And I really identified with this as, you know, a person that was really well-meaning but started to learn things that I. I couldn't continue to be a pacifist and understand. And I don't mean continue to be a pacifist in the sense that I don't want peace, but continuing to be a pacifist in the sense that how do you sit by when other people are, are suffering and dying, the actions that your government is taking, and what that is, is your own role in that. Um, so he sort of comes to, to resistance, to the idea that the resistance is necessary um, and I, I wanted to read a passage about um, his own role as a white person in these struggles. So let me go back to it. He talks about, um, in SDS and some of the organizations that he was working with, um, the role of exceptional whites. So he comfortably gets himself in a place of alliance with the oppressed and with people that are struggling. But he says, the real push for this action was our evolving politics around youth culture, which is something I think we see here a lot in Buffalo, too. Um, we had seen ourselves as exceptional whites. There are a handful of white people who were sincerely anti-racist. This sense of being so isolated had driven us towards spectacular and dangerous actions to try to have an impact. But there was a double error embedded in the exceptional whites perspective. First. It led us to abdicate our responsibility to organize other white people in an anti-racist way. And secondly, it expressed the conceit that we were now magically free of racism. So the exceptional white vanity had diverted us both from internal struggle with our own racism and from the challenge to do broader anti-racist organizing. In short, our position was more about promoting ourselves than about building the strongest possible solidarity with people of color. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that I really hope that we can go back to, and I think it's something that we as a community in Buffalo also need to struggle with um, very seriously, about how once we get ourselves comfortably on the side that we feel is just and righteous, to what extent do we continue interrogating our own positionality, our own role, and is there a point at which that can stop? I would argue there's not, um, but I hope, that, I hope that we can talk about that. Um, there's another passage that speaks to that that I wanted to bring up. I hope it's not too much for you. Sorry. Sorry if it is. No, it's fine. Okay, cool. You're great. You're um, great. So, the Weather Underground went through um, a collapse, he calls it, a struggle. Um, and he talks a lot about how uh, there are a lot of, so there's, there was a, a you know, major theoretical grounding in the Weather Underground. People were having a lot of theoretical discussions. And a lot of what was being discussed ended up being much more class oriented than race oriented class-oriented and gender-oriented. And so the issues of both whiteness and maleness got subsumed into the issues of class. Probably because these things are all easier for us to struggle around than issues of whiteness and maleness. So he says, especially after the collapse of the weather underground, I was anxious to reestablish myself as a revolutionary on the highest level, as the most anti-racist white activist. What better way to validate myself in this way than to work closely with the most revolutionary black group going? He's referring to the BLA, the Black Liberation Army. If the political and strategic terms weren't clear to me, I would quietly make myself useful until trust in a higher level of relationship developed. Not only is this a terribly wrong way to develop solidarity, but also the exceptional white person mentality usually undermines any serious effort to organize other people against racism a fundamental aspect of developing solidarity, working towards revolution. When some friends told me that this unit of the BLA had used me as a resource, my reply was that I had used them to be my source of validation. So here he's talking about the role of ego in, in, our, in our actions and in our commitment to revolution. Um, and he, he critiques himself. He said, what was required 
was an honest, ongoing process that involved both serious, serious introspection and constructive collective discussions. It's not like we're adrift on a featureless, turbulent sea. We're deeply rooted in the solid ground of the needs and aspirations of the oppressed. Whenever I start feeling full of myself, or sense that I'm taking a direction that's not right, I need to grapple with that, and if possible, get help. Um, so he's there looking at kind of what the consequences were, what, what happened, what white people were doing, and, and what the consequence of believing in this exceptional white mentality had. It led people to take actions that were not necessarily directly in alignment with the oppressed. And it led people to sort of step back from real anti-racist organizing in a way that was more about self-aggrandizement, I think is the word that he uses quite frequently. And he talks a little bit about the consequences of that, um, about how while a lot of um, people were organizing and being proud of themselves for being revolutionaries and quite honestly doing very good work, many members of the VLA were being killed. Um, so, one of those passages. I put, I put all these little things in my book, but they don't help because there's like eight of them. So I still have to find them. <laughs> um, so he says, here's where he discusses the consequences of not taking seriously enough, remembering the positionality of whiteness and maleness. He says, in the wake of the withering COINTELPRO attacks on revolutionary nationalists, and especially after the split of the Panthers, the spearheads for revolutionary change and activism throughout US society had considerably been blunted. The people we most admired, the BLA, were now getting gunned down by police and were on the run. When I asked the Central Committee why the BLA was taking a lot of busts when we weren't, the answer was the quality of their clandestine te technique compared to ours. The discussion didn't delve into the decisive differences rooted in racism. We could raise money from middle class friends while the BLA took its greatest losses doing robberies. We could blend into a much larger and less harassed population. And we were much less prone to routine police stops. When they did happen, we could talk our way out of them, while black people faced frequent hostile stops, for which underground cadres often led to shootouts. Our complacent discussion about the BLA's far more dire straits crystallized in how our doldrums resulted from an opportunism. So here he's talking about the, the direct consequences of that and, and the suffering of the organization specifically because of failing to take um, anti-racist organizing introspection seriously enough. Um, and then the last part that I wanted to, to talk about was um, David makes a lot of really he makes a lot of really humble and profound critiques, but he also gives a lot of advice, um, which is what I think is most powerful about this book. It's very very inspiring um, and gives a lot of really good guidance. And so he takes um, he takes very seriously the need to, as a collective, people that are organizing together and people that are working together, to really engage these issues collectively and take them seriously and talk them out amongst ourselves and come to very similar understandings and how that's crucial if we're going to be organizing together. And there was one paragraph that I found very striking. It's at the very beginning of the book, um, but I think that it sums up um, advice for us as organizers today very well. He says, in my experience, the best defense against the divisive tactics of COINTELPRO is to work hard to be true to our principles. We have to honestly look at and grapple with the ways that racism, sexism, homophobia, elitism, and competitiveness affect all of us who grew up in this society. We have to learn to handle differences among us in an open and loving way. We have to commit ourselves to full participatory discussion of politics, while at the same time protecting specifics that can be used by the state. Um, so that was kind of the note that I wanted to end on. Was, you know, the, the serious consequences that not taking these things seriously can have, but also the possibility that open collective discussion holds for being able to overcome some of them and not repeat the same mistakes that others are trying to teach us about. So that's it. Thank you, Brooke. Okay. Thank you. Karima, let's all applaud for Brooke, please. <laughs> That gives me a chance to think for a minute and regroup. That was really very, very well done. Um, Naomi said a couple of things that struck me when she said I got that award from UB in 2007. I think it was 2009. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Chuck was with me. He's a witness. He was there when I got that award. Um, I think they may have regretted giving it to me because when I had the opportunity to speak there um, at the university or wherever we were, I can't even remember where we were, 
Um, first of all, I was surprised that they had been paying attention to what I was doing with prisoners or people too. When they called me to say that I was receiving this distinguished humanitarian award, I thought it was for my almost 25 years of teaching in the Buffalo Public Schools, um, but that wasn't it. Then I thought it was about storytelling, which I've done now for almost 30 years, and they said I was getting this award for prisoners or people too, which really surprised me. But it gave me an opportunity when I received the award to really talk about what I was trying to do with the organization. At that time, we were only four years old. I was still feeling my way. And that's the other thing that struck me in the introduction. She said I was a long time activist, da 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 da, for prisoners. And doesn't feel long to me. Uh, I feel that I was actively engaged in some other things. As a public school educator, I was involved in education and good education. And I was very concerned about that and worked for the betterment of education. I'm not for public schools, private schools, <coughs> parochial schools, whatever schools. I'm interested in good schools that provide a good education and give children what it is that they need. So although I got some awards for the work that I did as a teacher, um, oftentimes, you know, I think back on it and I realize it sometimes happened and it was always a surprise to me because I always found myself bumping heads with somebody to get a job done. But I always believe that there's a thing you really want to do, know you need to do, you have to stand your ground. Uh-oh, should I be saying stand your ground? But you need to stand up, how's that? You need to stand up and you need to speak out and make sure that it happens. Um, what struck me in the very beginning with David's book, in the first chapter, Beginnings, was how much we had in common. I was reading it and going, oh yeah, me too. Oh yeah, me too. Uh-huh, me too. He grew up in a household with two parents. Me too. The home was safe, secure, and comfortable. Me too. Um, he had medical care, me too, and good food, yep, and clothing, uh-huh. We had so much in common. But his upbringing was in a middle-class suburban home, and mine was not. Uh, I grew up in Buffalo on the east side, and I remember the first home I lived in was on the corner of Howard and Adams in this city. It has since been torn down. We lived in the back of a deli. There was no yard. We played where the garbage cans were. I remember that. We played where two garbage cans were, and it was concrete. There was no grassy yard. But it was good. In 1954, when I was seven years old, family moved to Cold Spring area. <coughs> My parents bought a house on Butler, which is in the uh, Hamlin Park area. Uh, when my dad died in 2009, he had lived in that house for 50 years. A long time in that house. And the thought was one of us girls, my sisters or myself would buy it, but we really didn't because the neighborhood has changed so much. Really didn't want to live there. Uh, too much drug dealing going on, although I believe that neighborhood will come back because it is a preservation area. Somebody's going to do something to bring it back. But I'm reading the beginning of this, and it's like, me too, me too. Yeah, me too. Got a good education? Me too. Had parents who gave him ethics and morals? Yeah, mine did too. But there were some differences. But the one thing I noticed too, when I finally said, yep, me too, was something David mentioned in the DVD. I don't know if you noticed it. He mentioned missing the wink. Did anybody notice that in the movie? He talks about missing the wink. He missed it, so did I. I remember learning the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And like all good, school, all good school children do in public schools, you stand up every morning, and you throw your hand over your heart, and you say it. And then one day you learn that this place is not really a democracy, and if it is, it's a real jacked up democracy, and there is no freedom and justice for all. Like, who is the for all? I thought that meant me too. 
But you learn along the way that it doesn't. David learned that, I learned that, and I was beginning to understand it when I was 10 years old, and we went south. And I saw separate water fountains, and I saw separate lodgings, and I saw a lot of separate stuff as a 10-year-old. And my mother and my father told me stories about their growing up. That was my first trip going south to North Carolina, South Carolina. I was 10 years old. And in 1955 was the lynching of Emmett Till, and 1955 was um, the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. I was eight, so I didn't really get it until later. But once again, I was confronted with the fact that there was no liberty and justice for all in this country. Leaving high school and then going to the University of Buffalo um, as an undergrad, that was 1965. 1965 was a really big year. And the passage I'm going to read speaks about 65, 66, 68, and the beginning of a number of black organizations that were important to me although I wasn't a member of any of them. I guess I didn't have the courage that David had, or maybe I didn't have the commitment that David had, but I was understanding what these organizations were about, what they meant to me personally, what they meant to my history, and to my people. My years in high school uh, were the beginnings of understanding who I was as a black person and a black woman. And more and better understanding came when I went to the University of Buffalo and was introduced to SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, because they were the ones bringing the black notables to the campus. They were the ones who brought Eldris Cleaver, Kathleen Cleaver, Huey P. Newton, H. Rap Brown, Dick Gregory, people that I was reading about in black news but never thought I would ever have a chance to meet face to face. But they brought them to the campus, and I became close friends with members of SDS. But I was still finding my way, feeling my way, and figuring out who I was. In 68, <coughs> the University of Buffalo finally, black students organized, finally for Black Student Union. They were popping up all over the nation, and we finally got ours. And that gave me more of an understanding. I'm going to read this section that struck me as important called Black Power. And David begins this section with a dream. The tutoring section, I'm sorry, the tutoring session ran late and night had already fallen. This is in his dream. As I walked to the subway, the street is unusually empty and eerily quiet. Suddenly, there's a loud crash and sounds of glass breaking and angry shouts. A crowd surges around the corner, mainly young black men with their eyes darting up and down the block like they're looking for a target. Is this the beginning of a second Harlem riot? I'm the only white person around, and I nervously scan the array of faces, trying to find one of my friends who can tell, who can tell them that I'm a good guy. I'm on their side. But I don't see anyone I know, and it doesn't matter as they sweep past me, heading down the street. Once my attention drains away, I wake up, smiling. I appreciate the way the dream worked through my anxieties. Whatever's happening is not all about me, one way or the other. That frees me to evaluate the dramatic new slogan politically, and it's starting to make a lot of sense. And that dramatic new slogan is, of course, Black Power. When the slogan Black Power erupted in the summer of 1966, it sent shockwaves throughout the country, first shouted by a SNCC field worker, SNCC, S-N-C-C, that was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Willie Ritz. It became publicized and developed by Stokely Carmichael, later known as Kwame Toure. Actually, the concept is much older. 
Richard Wright, for example, wrote a book in 1954 entitled Black Power, inspired by the struggles for independence in Africa. But the slogan became a breakthrough in 1966 because it expressed the necessity of moving to a higher level of charity and struggle. I supported the slogan, but like many white activists, I was also afraid of it. I remember white activists being afraid of it. And I remember feeling happy. I felt glad. It was like good. So there. In the early days and in the early readings of this book, when David talks about his childhood, and I had a lot of me too's, I also know that there were a lot of things I have that he didn't have, a lot of things that he had that I didn't have. I don't know how many of you saw the movie The Help. Um, I didn't see the movie, but I did read the book. My mother was the help. Um, she cleaned white people's laundry, and she cooked for them. But she never agreed to raise their children or to clean their homes. That was something she said she just wouldn't do. She was waiting to get married and to have a house of her own where she could clean her own house and raise her own children, which is what she did. After she raised the three of us, she got four foster children and raised some more. And cleaning was her thing. She was fanatic about cleaning. I remember her cleaning ceilings. And we used to say, well, you know, who's going to look at the ceiling? And it didn't matter. She didn't pay us any attention. She just kept, kept scrubbing. I wish my sisters were here. They could better describe how she cleaned and how she scrubbed. That was her thing. I remember being in kindergarten when my mother got her eighth grade diploma. And I remember hearing stories about how my dad only went to third grade. But he was the smartest man I've ever known. He's been gone a while. But still I say he's the smartest man I've ever known. So there were a lot of things that angered me. Um, things I thought I should have had, but I didn't have, but I still had good stuff. And it wasn't until I was in high school and going into college that I better understood the lynching of Emmett Till, and that I better understood what Rosa Parks did on December 1st, 1955. And the things I knew about my history in terms of oppression, depression, repression, and even um, what I learned about um, my people being enslaved, a lot of that angered me. And it wasn't anger that I outwardly expressed, but inside it didn't anger me. And I remember hearing Black Power for the first time. And I remember seeing Stokely Carmichael on TV, the Black and White TV, Black Power. And I was like, yeah. And it made me feel good. So the fact that white activists were afraid made me feel good too. And no white activist came up to me and said, Carol, that was my name then, I'm scared. Nobody said that, but I could tell that they were afraid. And it made me feel good. Whites had a lot of power within the civil rights movement, whether consciously or not. White educational background and prestige in society were manipulated to gain disproportional control while the development of black leadership was being stifled. Whites had something to protect. It was comfortable to be at the peak of a morally prestigious movement for change while black people were taking most of the casualties in the struggle, which is something that you referred to. On the other hand, the challenge of anti-racist organizing within our own communities was difficult to take on. Also, behind the Black Power slogan was a struggle around nonviolence. Most whites in the movement tended to be ideologically committed to nonviolence. The young black field workers, workers of SNCC had seen too many blacks murdered, began to advocate armed self-defense. The name was soon changed so that the N of SNCC, S-N-C-C, stood for national rather than nonviolent. Despite, despite my initial defensiveness, Black power made fundamental sense to me on many levels. First, it expressed the basic reality that black people had to develop their own leadership and set the terms of their own liberation. 
I was happy to read that because that's what I felt in 1966. Second, it challenged us to organize a revolutionary consciousness within the white community, thus focusing us on our primary responsibility. Black power also taught an important political lesson. The need was not, as we had thought, to shape the moral consciousness of America. Those in power knew very well what they were doing. The point, rather, was to shift or overturn who had power, from the small elite on top to the vast majority underneath it. So the Black Power slogan also became a, fun, a fountainhead for the development of a revolutionary tendency within the white student movement. I think that's still important today. We don't have to shout black power or white power or green power. Although green power is all right. But you know, you don't have to shout about it. It's about what we do. It's about what we say from the heart when we talk to people and when we decide that we have to work together. One thing that holding on to black power and to black nationalism did for me was to ground me. The more I learned about black power and black nationalism, the more I learned about my history. And the more I learned about my history, the better I felt about myself. And I think that before you do any kind of work, any kind of work, as it relates to social justice, you need to know who you are. It's important to be grounded in that. Because when you know who you are, I think it makes you more open to embracing the stories of other people. I will still say, yeah, black power, and wear my little dashiki and everything, and wear my hair natural from now until the cows come home. But I think that it is my grounding in knowing who I am, what I want in life, what I honor, and what my worldview is, my worldview, my, my, and mine. Knowing that about myself, and I know I'm repeating myself, but I really believe it makes me more open and more willing to embrace the stories of other people. I didn't grow up thinking about prisons or prisoners. And until 1994, I'd never been in a prison. And when I was invited in, I was invited in as a storyteller. Prisoners were hearing me on the radio. They responded to the stories that gave them comfort and gave them hope and gave them inspiration. And going in to tell the stories, when I say that, sometimes people laugh. You told them stories? Yeah, why not? Stories are for everybody. Storytelling is not just what I do, it's who I am. So being invited anywhere is real important for me. My first invitation came from Attica, and it spread from there. When I saw former students behind bars, that was what flipped the script for me. Meeting people who were political prisoners and prisoners of conscience, that's what flipped the script for me. But I was able to understand and embrace these men and women because I know who I am. And I wanted to know their stories and embrace their stories and honor their stories. When I came back home, sometimes after going into a prison to tell stories, and, and I would tell, talk to family and friends about what I had seen and what I had learned, um, too many people said, so what? If somebody's locked up, they ought to be. Why do you care? Well, for one, I